Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm Edouard Alligan, founder of Bureau 14. Um, today I'm going to talk about, to you about um, scaling with C++11. And to talk to you about scaling, we start from what we've been doing since 2008 which is uh, the date of your, our creation. We've built a um, non-relational database, another one, which is uh, hyperscalable. And everything I'm going to tell you has been field tested. It's not some theoretical research. Our engine is currently running in banks to uh, process millions of, of euros every day. So we had to face real issues and we had to fix them and we had to make sure that it actually works. But this talk would be very, I would start with very, very high level with very, what is, what does it mean to scale? What does it mean to make a software to scale? And then we go further in the details and we'll end up with the most technical and the most hardcore stuff. And I hope we will enjoy this talk uh, very much. Please hesitate, don't hesitate. If you have any question, just raise your hand, no problem. I will try to answer the best I can. So, 200 years ago, uh, when I was a student in 1999, uh, it feels like 200 years ago because we were 100 students working on one computer which had two CPUs. It was an UltraSpark station, I don't remember the reference. By then, it was among students say, oh, we're using a computer with two CPUs, and uh, we were very, very impressed. And we were using the computer by, with uh, physical terminals. Um, nowadays, we, you use software terminals. And this server basically run everything you had, Netscape, um, Pine, uh, Amax, everything. Uh, in 2013, uh, if I want to access two CPUs, I just take my phone, which has got two CPUs. Under my desk, I have 12 CPUs. Well, it's not exactly 12 CPUs, but I have 12 cores. Um, those cores, well, not maybe they can process 4 billion operations per second. This is, we have an incredible amount of speed at our disposal. And yet, we have somehow uh, a problem with performance today. Um, one of the reasons has got nothing to do with scalability is it's a software stack problem because we tend to stack up a lot of script interpreters, virtual machine, virtual machine interpreters, and so at the end of the day you were basically emulating the computers that are, were running 30 years ago on a modern machine. But uh, one of the reasons we have is, um, as other people have said it before me, is the free lunch is over. That you cannot expect Intel to come up with a new processor that will just make your software run faster because it just magically runs everything faster. You will have, if you have been to Artmut um, presentation, uh, he already stressed out that, uh, you have to make sure that your software, whatever software it is, can take advantage of the multi-cores. And this is easy, as multi-threading is easy. When you have only two cores, maybe you can go up to four cores, and then when you want to reach eight cores, 16 cores, and very soon hundreds of cores, because in 2020, your computer is going to have hundreds of cores. Then it's not going to work anymore. And this is going to be very painful for a lot of people. And if you start now, maybe it's going to be just a little bit less painful. Um, this is, you have a scalability problem, but the question is, do you? Um, you may not. Uh, and this is the first thing you have to make sure before you embark into log free, into STD, async, or I don't know. You have to make sure that your CPU is your problem. You have to make sure that um, your program is going to eat up whatever resource you are going to have. And you have to make sure that you care about performance. And well, if you write software in C++, it's likely that you care about performance. But you have to make sure, because you, we're going to see that a scalable software um, is sometimes less efficient than a non-scalable software. So if you don't need scalability, it's 
useless to have the cost. A little bit like making a, multi a program thread safe is expensive. You're going to see that scalability is worse than um, multi-threading. And there's this, this is when you work uh, outside academia. Uh, this is a very valid concern because uh, we may, you may have to cope with the fact that you cannot do whatever you should do to make yourself a scale. Then this is where everybody is, is, well, I need some performance, but I don't need extreme performance. But this talk is about extreme performance. So we are a bit crazy, so you're probably not as crazy as we are. Um, take everything I'm going to say with a grain of salt, because we're going to see very extreme optimization, very extreme um, concerns that you may not have. In which case you say, oh yeah, it's crazy, I'm not, so I'm not going to do that. Plus I did not understand, so it's more likely I don't want to do it. And then there's the hubris uh, to take, um, well, if your software really scales very well, if you have a very nice design, then yeah, it will make your mouth a problem. <laughs> Um, just a few words about us, um, just to give you a context. Um, about me, originally I'm a kernel developer. Uh, I've done kernel programming for Windows at FreeBSD. So many of my obsessions have come from the kernel world. Um, we are an independent software uh, vendor based in France. Uh, as I said, we, we sell a database to date mainly to banks. Um, it has been designed from the ground up, and I use the, the term postmodern database because I really don't like the term NoSQL, uh, but you can use it if you want. Uh, some benchmark because, hey, <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is scalability. Uh, just for information, the machine doesn't handle more than 20 threads in hardware, so this is why at some point you have, but it can scale very well. And just to have this, uh, this is not so bad, and you're going to see when you try to make your software scale, uh, this is really not so bad, and I think we can do even better. And then this one is much more interesting, that is you have real 500 simultaneous hardware requests, and how do you handle them as you augment the size of the request? And this is where you see that most benchmarks they say, oh yeah, no problem, and then you increase the size of the data you have to process, and this is where you see that the software scales or not. This is where you, when you want your software to scale, it has to resist hurricanes, it has to resist floods, it has to resist nuclear war, it has to resist everything, and this is what you have to do. So, we, this is kind of the layout of the presentation. The first step is design, and we're going to see why. Uh, your design must be scalable and this is a bit obvious, but we're going to see that it's not that obvious. Then, this is where I said I'm a kernel developer. Um, this is, you can't imagine how much important your memory management is to scalability. And this is very often I said, I don't understand. I have no locks, I have everything, and it doesn't scale, it doesn't use all my CPUs. Why? So this might be a reason, and then we're going to see there might be other reasons, such as hidden locks. Um, this is a question, so you say we're in 2013, let's say you have nothing, you're just going to build a new software, and you say, is it relevant to use C++? You could use Go, you could use Scala, you could, you could use Erlang. Um, it's interesting to have a look at these languages, but if you want to reach the very high notes of performance because of memory management, you're going to see that, to me, C++ and especially C++ 11 with not so many features that have been added but makes everything different, uh, is really the great, a great tool to make scalable software and to reach very high level of performance. Um, so, the design for scalability we're going to take the concepts that are 30 years old. So <laughs> it's just, just taking, we, mainly it's, everything I'm going to say is more or less based on a paper which is written by Mr. Ho, uh, who are, I don't know how to pronounce his name, um, it's Communicating Sequencing Processes. Um, this paper is a bit visionary because it really applies to what 
we try to do in scalability today. It's an interesting read, but it's a bit dated in many concerns that do not exist anymore today. Um, so yes, there's going to be a lot of CGI in this presentation. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> um, let's say you want to build a piston. Why a piston? It's because we found the animation on the web, so we thought it was cool. <laughs> but the idea is you want to make an object. Um, if you're alone and you're going to say, I'm going to make an object and sell this object, then it's just a question of making sure you assemble the, the object right, that you have some sort of uh, good QA, good well, you just write your program to work. This is what you do currently. And in the end, it's difficult, but it's a process you, most of all, uh, I think everybody knows how to make a software that works. Uh, in this room, no, I don't mean everywhere, <laughs> obviously. And then you have some success and you need to build many objects, many pistons. And well, you're going to hire workers to help you with this. And when you have two workers, it's not going to be very difficult. They're just going to do the s exact same work every day. And they take the pieces, they assemble the pistons, and then you sell them. And then you start to do, to increase your throughput, throughput and then you start to hire more and more people and then at some point you cannot increase your production whatever even if you have 1000 workers it's not going to work and it's an analogy to remember that um, even if you throw threads at your programs to somehow use CPU uh, you have on your machine if your program is not designed to scale, to scale it will not change a single thing so what you have to do is to do a Star Trek reference, uh, which is very important. If you don't know what to do, just think Star Trek, and the answer is yes. So change the gravi gravitational constant of the universe. It's in an episode, so they had a moon crashing on a planet, and they wanted to prevent the moon from crashing to th in the planet, and one of the characters says, well, it's easy, you have to change the gravitational constant of the universe, which is um, complicated. But uh, uh, you, what, what, there is two things in this sentence. First is think out of the box, but you know that it's important. And then it's, um, the important thing is remember that in your computer you can do everything you want. There is absolutely no limit. You have the hardware limit, but as we've seen, the hardware limits are so far beyond your program. So you should when you are stuck, you could say, oh, maybe I'm just in the wrong direction. I have to go back. And this is what we are, we are doing when we, we try to build many pistons. Because if you want to manufacture billions of pistons, it's not going to work. So you will have to lay out a process. And OK, this process is it's probably not working. But the concept is you have independent steps, which are just related to each other through messages, we're going to talk about that somehow. And there is no shared state. That is, when I work here, I don't care what's going to happen here or here or here. If I have a problem here, then I'm just going to have a problem here, but I can continue to work here. And then, well, you have some human being uh, at some point, well, but who cares? And then you assemble the piston. What is important here is, in the uh, paper I talk about, is uh, no shared state, no central state, have steps independent. So you're going to say, well, today when I design my program, even not to be scalable, I try to have interfaces and I try to be, um, to contain, to have no leaky abstraction. This is a very powerful concept. But what I say here is that not only you don't want to have leaky abstraction, but you want to make sure that the way you communicate between um, each step is just a matter of sending a message that, that you are able to package all the work done into a single message and then you have kind of stateless it's very hard to do sometimes to be fully stateless, stateless but every step is able to work only based on what it received and then it's going to output so it's a bit of a functional approach with, which is another of my obsession um, scalable design so that's it. You have a module, and then you, you, you're basically building a pipeline. Um, 
as an extension, you could also say that you're building a graph, but most of the time you can say it's a pipeline. Uh, if you start to have a graph, maybe it's because you have a more complex uh, structure. Um, what is important is no shared state, because if you have a shared state, what must you do? You must lock. And when you lock, what are you doing? You are transforming a multi-threaded application into a single-threaded application. Never forget that. That is, every time you're using a lock, you're destroying everything you try to do with scalability. We're going to see that, of course, sometimes you have to lock. How, how, how hard you can try to not lock, you have to lock. But never forget that. And the, um, we're going to see that as well is, sometimes you lock and you don't know it. And this is nasty. Um, this is true for any program, but uh, and this is very important. Never block. Um, Artmut said, never wait, never wait. Um, remember, keep your keep your pipeline going because your processor is a pipeline as well, and this is why you want to reflect. Um, mathematically speaking, this is just to show off. Uh, we don't care. Uh, in C++, when I say you want to have uh, steps uh, taking, uh, obviously, more than an int, but the concept is this. Uh, I'm a step, I'm a functor, I get a result, and I output an, a result. And maybe the input is just the parameter of my program, and I return a value. And you can write any program that way. It's a functional approach, but it works very well for scalability. And we're going to see why. The reason why is, um, no, I don't care, I don't care, yes. The reason why is when you want to make your software scale, that is, let's say you have designed your software to have these modules, then the moment you want to say, now I want to use my CPU, it's just a question to make every step work on a different thread or different task, to be more precise. It's just a question to make sure that each CPU is going to take a little bit of the work. And this is much easier than having your existing program and trying to add threads wherever you can to scale. Um, once you have that, it's just a question of maybe we're going to see then after. Uh, 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 yes, OK. So asynchronous IO, OK, my slides are in the more world, OK. Um, if you, at some point, you have um, a work which appears to be more intensive, that is going to require more CPU than the other parts, then what you're going to do is just say, OK, so this work is so hard that I have to split it into smaller works. And this is just a question of adding a module to split the input, and then spread that, and then merge the result. And that's it you've solved the bottleneck. And another interesting feature is that it's very easy to benchmark your software. Because once you know that each module has only one input and only one output, you can measure everything. You can say, OK, sometimes modules, um, they don't eat enough CPU. So you have to actually make several modules work in a two and single task. You can have to, this is called packaging the task into one task. And sometimes, like this one, you have to split uh, the, the task into smaller tasks because otherwise you're not going to scale. And the other option is uh, sometimes the CPU is not, uh, the module is not doing that much work, but it's in the critical path and it's intensely used. So what you can do is make it support to handle uh, many messages at once. And at the end, we, sh we see techniques to do that. Uh, concurrency is very hard, but uh, this is a shortcut we, we took uh, in our software to make sure that it's going to scale. Because um, when you manage to have a module that is able to kind of um, handle many messages at once, uh, you can really have a very, very good performance. But what I want to talk about is asynchronous I.O. Um, we've, you've, if you have been to many of the talks to, uh, to this year of conference, um, you have seen that uh, a lot of has been said about features, asynchronous operations. 
uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, I would say be, uh, don't try to be overly asynchronous. Um, let's try to have you um, message uh, handling which is as a whole a single asynchronous process, but don't try inside this always asynchronous process to have other asynchronous operations because you can kill your performance very easily. However, you're going to have a problem the minute you want to do input-output because input-output doesn't work at the same speed as your CPU. So you have two possibilities. The first one is to wait on the output, but then you're going to kill your scalability. The other possibility is to use every operating system has got asynchronous I.O. features that you should use. And don't package asynchronous operation uh, such as I.O. into asynchronous task in C++ such as STD async or futures, don't do that. You're going to get very poor performance because if you do that, you're going to have one thread somewhere blocking the waiting for the I.O. where you could just say to the operating system, well, when you have finished writing to the disk, please tell me. And this is so less expensive than running a thread to do that. And as a design, and this is where the, um, this is not so obvious to fit into a module design. It's, so you have your workflow and then you have an IO intensive task. And so you have to somehow say, okay, the result is pending, now I can take another message. And the kernel is going to process your IO and when it's finished, it's going to call what is called an IO completion routine in Windows. Um, don't remember the name in Linux. Uh, and so you're going to be called. Your callback is going to be called to say, okay, I have finished, and this is where you can um, resume your workflow where you left it. And this is, yes? In a sense, it looks to me that you can treat the kernel and the IO, whatever, some system is just another module, and you send it a message yes. right to some kind of file, and it's simply Yes, uh, so the remark was um, you can treat your I.O. as a module and then just uh, wait for the messages. But the thing is, you have a client waiting for an answer at the other side. And so it's, you have to, to maximize workflow. What we've done is um, you, your I.O. module, it can process other requests while it's waiting for responses. This is what this schematic is about. But yes, you're right, um, in a way it's just a module, but I'm just zooming inside the module. Um, Isn't this very operating system dependent? Because the way that Windows handles I.O. Uh, is a lot, a lot slower than the way that like Linux is going to handle I.O., especially like, uh, for instance, writing to a file, it's going to be much, much different. Okay, the, the question is, uh, is it operating system dependent because in Windows you don't get the same uh, disk performance than in Linux. Not, not even disk, like when you call write, you're going to write into virtual memory on Linux. Yes. But that's not the case on Windows. Um, okay, this is a very kind of specific issue. Uh, we have the same performance in a software in Windows and Linux. So you can achieve that, but you just have to dig a little bit in the, in the API. So but uh, yes, I, am, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, we use, um, uh, no, the name is not completion port. Uh, you know what, I can look up uh, in the source code that I have in my room and I can tell you what we've done exactly because it's actually one of the first lines we wrote four years ago. Um, we use, um, uh, we don't have a lot of disk operation for the network operations. Uh, it's actually very transparent because we use uh, the sockets, uh, asynchronous sockets operation, which are asynchronous socket call, as async write, I don't remember. But uh, for disk, I, I cannot answer because I, I don't remember. But um, yes, this is a very good remark because uh, if you have a multi-platform software, you're going to have very nasty surprise when you take your software and the asynchronous I.O. part it behaves totally different from one operating system to the other, but there is no reason you should get within a certain range the same amount of performance. We managed to do it, so there is no reason you cannot do it. But there are no nasty tricks. Yes? So, so many people 
when you call them a synchronous operation, yes. you can only kernel I presume there's a kernel thread that yes. created. Could you explain why would I want to do that instead of having a thread pool at the user space and just calling the blocking operation? Um, because um, when you're going to create the thread in your user program, Okay. And okay, so the remark is um, well, if I have a thread pool in user mode, why is it going to be less expensive in the kernel? But because maybe there is a kernel thread pool already? Well, no, what, what I'm asking is why would I want to switch to the kernel? Yeah. But you're going to switch to the kernel anyway. Well, of course, when you do the system call. I, I, yeah. I'm just asking why is it more advantageous? Because um, you're going to get only one transition. Uh, this is one of the reasons. Um, I, generally speaking, I cannot answer the question, but if we talk about a very specific operating system, we could say, oh, in this case, it's going to be better. And one of the reasons is, no offense, but maybe it's better done in the kernel than in your program. That might be one of the reasons. And they, because there are things, and not because uh, there are more intelligent people working in the kernel, but there are things you can do in the kernel in terms of uh, concurrency. We're going to see some tricks that you cannot do in user mode. And so they, it's a little bit like you have a cheat mode here. here and you want to take advantage of the cheat mode. Uh, OK. We don't care. We don't care. OK. Uh, so not going to spend too much time on um, the design uh, because I have some more fun stuff to show you. So basically what you want to do is don't think too much about threads. Think about tasks and try to have your task um, run f within a certain duration that is not too, sl not too short, not too long. And then you Ah, yes, and then you have to be very careful about this. Uh, just make sure that you have no big shared state you have to pick data from because this is going to be pick, kill your scalability. It's going to be very hard to redesign around. Um, so far, so good. Any question? Okay. Uh, the, yes. This is basically you don't have to approach scalability as a feature like I made my program. The same way you don't say my program is secure, secure it's not a feature. It's uh, because you uh, have a process and you've a design process and you can say that your program is secure. In the same way you've designed your program to be scalable and now is, that's why it's scalable. And just to finish with this, what I would say is um, when you design for scalability, you have to make some trade-offs. When you design, generally speaking, you have to make some compromise. Um, you have to make some design decisions that may be good for scalability, but would not be good for non-scalable program. And this is why when you have a, a, an open mind and you say, I want my program to run on 1,000, 10,000 cores, and if you start to think that way, just do that. And you're going to see things differently. Say, oh yes, this would not work. Yes, this is going to be a problem. So now my favorite part, <laughs> memory, memory strategies. Um, why is memory management so important for scalability? Well, for one reason, uh, you want, you're going to have um, many threads access data. So you will have to make sure that the way they access memory, the way they allocate memory, this is a nasty uh, problem often. Uh, it's not going to kill your wonderful design just because at some point you have to wait for the memory allocator to finish. This is stupid. And it's not just a question of using a high performance scalable allocator. It's harder than that. You have to go beyond that if you really want to go very far in the field of uh, scalability and performance. Um, some reminder, when you read to share that data, it scales, it scales perfectly, no problem. So remember, when you read, you don't have a problem. You don't have a scalability problem. But the problem is when you try to write, and at some point, I think you want to write data somewhere, uh, you have no scalability at all. And you say, but I don't have locks. 
And what do you think? That your, program, your computer is just going to write to memory and let you do anything you want? At some point, you're going to have a hardware constraint that say, well, I'm, if you, no problem, CPU 1, if you want to write to memory, but just wait for CPU 2 to be finished. So this is um, one of the major reasons why people can be disappointed, for example, by log-free structures. Because they use a log-free structure, they use atomics, and we're going to talk about atomics, and say, but but doesn't scale. Why? Okay, I don't care. I'm just going to run multiprocess. <laughs> Uh, memory management is difficult in any language, even if you have a garbage collector, even it's always very difficult. It's actually a core computer science problem. Is it's uh, the lifetime of an object. Uh, when is going to, when can I kill my object? When can I destroy the object? And this is very hard to answer, generally speaking. So in C++, the idiom is to use shared pointer, which is value uh, reference counted uh, memory management. But we're going to see that unfortunately they don't scale that well. So it's like it's a nightmare when you really want to scale like crazy. It's like everything you rely on doesn't work anymore. And this is very upsetting at first, but then it's very interesting because you have to learn new stuff and you have to to discover new techniques. And fortunately. You are using every day programs that have been designed to scale and that have been designed to scale 20 years ago. It's your operating system because the operating system uh, already has to handle scalability because when you buy uh, your new shiny 16 core machine, uh, you're not going to say to accept that your operating system is going to say, well, I'm only going to use four cores. Uh, end of the story. So. This is, if you are stuck at some point in your design, I'm going to show you some techniques. You should read documentation about kernels and kernel um, techniques, and maybe there is the answer to your problem. So value-based memory management. Um, it's actually a good idea to duplicate data um, when you want to scale. As you, we have seen in our um, module approach uh, design, uh, very often you're going to have messages that are going to replicate data that you have internally. So you're going to say, hey, it's less efficient. Yes, but it scales because you don't care. It's a copy, so you can access it. No luck, no worries. So it's a good first approach. Just pass data, copy it, and work on it. But if the data is big, then you have a problem. And Perfect forwarding doesn't solve it because um, sometimes you have different threads accessing the same data, data and because one thread may want to modify it and the other thread wa just want to read it, uh, if you don't duplicate the data but do perfect forwarding, you have a problem. You, have, you are back to the, I have to lock to access my, my data. Um, this is actually a very good solution. Uh, the SS71 solution, it's uh, actually it's a plane from the 60s uh, made in the US. It's a plane that made in the 60s that could fly to Mach 3. So it's a pretty impressive fit. And where am I going at? It's, um, they had a problem because they obviously didn't have the materials we have now. And so because the plane was flying so fast, the, you, the, um, the, all the materials expanded with the temperature. So they had a problem with the uh, fuel tank because um, they had holes because to let the um, parts grow. So when the plane was uh, on the ready to take off, it was leaking fuel because they could not make a material that could withstand uh, the temperatures and uh, feed the holes. Um, today it's different. So they say, okay, no problem, we're going to let it leak, and then once it's, the, it, uh, it's in the, the air, it's going to refuel. And sometimes one way to scale is to just leak memory. Scary what I'm saying, but in some cases you're just leaking maybe one byte every month. I'm exaggerating, but in many cases it's acceptable if you know the context of usage of a program, and if you just can let the memory leak, then you have very good scalability in the sense that you don't have to care about the lifetime of your object. So you have nothing to write, not a single line of code for the memory management. 
And actually, in the boost log free um, implementation, they say we only release the memory inside the container when you destroy the container. So you could have memory leaks in your program if you add and remove a lot of stuff. And no, I think if you remove, somehow it should reuse the data, I'm not sure, but let's say it does. But so the leak approach, and it's a good option, or maybe you have a very fancy design, but sometimes in your memory management system, you have a doubt and say, okay, I'm going to leak. I have doubt, I am going to leak, and I have a problem. You reason in terms of probability and you say it's acceptable. And especially in cases where you know that your program is going to be restarted every hour or every week or that kind of stuff, this is a solution that we've used, <laughs> but not anymore. Uh, reference counted objects, as I said, um, if you think uh, share pointers are free, you are wrong. They are not, because there is an atomic to be updated every time you move your object. And you may have seen in some code uh, people giving uh, shared pointers through cons references. And this is to avoid this problem. But still, um, it's not really important the difference between STD and boost. Uh, it could be, uh, uh, I don't think there should, it's an old, be old benchmark I've done. Um, just this is important. That is, your pointer is uh, when you start to have a lot of threat and you have a lot, lot of number of objects which are, uh, increases. So you, when you have very few objects, almost no difference. But then, as you can see, at the cost, because you have your counter to update every time you do a, a thing. And it's a central sta state. This is a central value that you have to write to, because you say, I increase to one, and I decrease, etc. And this is typically a hidden shared write that you can have in your program. You look everywhere. You say, well, I don't understand. I should scale. And say, you're using shared pointers? Yes. OK. So you are writing concurrently to the same memory address. So one approach is, if you can, just recycle uh, your objects. Uh, we do that for the sessions uh, in, your pro in our program. A session is an object we allocate when a client connects to the server. We create a session and when the client deconnects, we destroy the session. But the difference is we don't actually release the memory because even with the high performance allocator, uh, getting and releasing memory is expensive. And when you are crazy about performance and scalability, you really, really, really want to cut, cut all the corners. So we are using its uh, Intel Threading Building Blocks Allocator. In this case, we're creating <coughs> a buffer large enough to receive your object. Then we use a placement new. And when we need to recycle the object because the client disconnects and another one comes, then what we do is just we call the destructor. And in some cases, you can even not call this to gain some cycles if you're a little bit crazy about performance. And then we just reconstruct. And this, what it does is it's just going to call the constructor on the memory location you already have. No scalability issue. It's just a question of filling your object. It's very, very fast. It's a big difference. And to do that, what you can do is at startup, you pre-allocate, let's say, 100,000 sessions because you say, uh, my software doesn't support more than uh, that for concurrent connections. And this is the difference that because um, since we work with the bank industry and sometimes they do evil stuff such as uh, high frequency trading and they are really looking for the extreme latency and this is typically the kind of stuff you can g gain some few cycles that will make the difference between the competitive we, with the competition. And uh, when I mean competition, I don't mean our competition, I mean our customers' competition. What, what, do, you, what do you do when you overrun your uh, available pool? You say uh, connection refused, in our case. But if your pool is large enough, uh, you can hit a uh, system limit before. And so this depends on the, on the context. Maybe you can say, oh, I'm going to reallocate a larger pool. This is not a problem. 
it really depends on what you're trying to do. The question was, uh, what do you do when uh, you reach the limit of your pool? Uh, this one is nice. Uh, unfortunately, if you work in the US, you cannot use it because you have a patent. But I work in Europe, though, so I don't care. <laughs> uh, so the idea is um, every time um, a thread is uh, working on an object, is going to put the pointer in a list. And to know if I can destroy an object, I say, I just look in the list. Are you in the list? Then you can come in. If you're not in the list, get out. Uh, this is. This is, that's all. But to be perform a performant implementation, what you can do is to have each thread in the TLS have is its own list. And then you can, um, th you're going to multiply your memory usage by the number of threads. And then what you can do is also manage the list in a way that you're going to make sure that when you are going to want to remove entries, uh, you, are, you wait for the list to, you give a limit, you say when I have, uh, I don't know, uh, 1000 pointers in my list, I'm going to see if I can remove uh, data. And then, end of the story. Uh, there is a very good explanation of this in a book which is um, Asynchronous Programming in C++. I gave a reference uh, at the end of the talk. Um, it goes, it goes with, it gives very good uh, code examples of how to make your own and uh, it gives you all the steps to go from the basic implementation from the, yes? Uh, so, can I have a question on your previous slide? Okay, sure. Um, so, so much code is actually dependent on you using pointer value as identity of the object. So, when you do this, when you're recycling the same buffer, the identity is not the pointer anymore, but the object needs to Maybe there needs to be something beyond that. Ah, okay. Okay, so your question is, if I understood correctly, you're saying I cannot uniquely identify my object through their pointers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yes, you cannot anymore. So maybe you can add a field, uh, such as an ID. Um, in our case, we don't care. Uh, it can lead to nasty bugs where you are working, uh, you don't understand what's going on because um, you are reusing your addresses. So as a safety, what you can do is um, you cannot reuse immediately. You can make sure that you reuse the oldest pointer. Yes, another question? No, it's the uh, same thing. Exactly. The, the remark is, it's like using a memory pool and you have the same, the same issues. So in a way, it's a memory pool. So I mean, a memory pool or using an allocator? Yes. 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 Yes, exactly. It's more bespoke to be... Yes, the remark was, um, again, that it's like using a custom allocator or memory pool, just a little bit more constrained and more bespoke. No more question? So, but my favorite slide is this one. <laughs> um, it's actually a technique in the Linux kernel. Um, it's uh, when you want to, you cannot do that efficiently in user mode. Um, the reason why we're going to see, the idea is to say that it's kind of uh, MVCC. It's kind of saying um, every CPU is going to work on the data. And when, let's say, one, as soon as you have a modification, you create a new version. So if I'm a CPU working on my private copy of the data, no problem. It's uh, consistency is respected. I, I do not have a problem. I'm working on version one, I'm doing my stuff, etc. And if a thread modifies and you create a new version, and then the new CPU comes in and says, OK, I have the new version, I can come in my new version, and you have no luck whatsoever. So you're going to say, well, when can I destroy version 1? Yes? The idea is exactly the same as transactional memory, right? Um, the question is, is it like transactional memory? And I would say, mm, 
let's say Michael will answer this question <laughs> in his talk about transactional memory. Um, in a way, yes, it's a transactional concept. The thing is, in kernel, you can know when no one is accessing no process because in the kernel you see processors. Um, you can know, oh, okay, no processor is uh, accessing this value anymore because I say that when you are in the area, the RCU, read, copy, update area, I say that you cannot um, switch context uh, in a way that is, uh, if you access your data, you cannot be interrupted. And if you have been interrupted by the scheduler of the kernel, but remember, you are in kernel, so you know what's going on. You say, that is, you're finished working on the data. I don't know if it's clear, but um, I realize it's a bit uh, complex to explain. Um, and OK. Uh, the thing is, um, in the kernel, you know everything. In the user mode, you don't. So in the kernel, you know when a CPU is not working anymore on a, on a value because you know that is switch context when he was accessing the value. And that's all you need to know. And it's less expensive than waiting for a reference. And you don't have to wait uh, to update um, maybe uh, a flag or anything. You just know because of the way it works. And in real-time system, it's a little bit more complicated because you have the constraint of being able to answer to a request within a limited time. But that's pretty much it. Um, if you're interested in read copy update, there is a very good explanation on the web. Just type read copy update, and this may give you IDs for your program. But again, I said I don't think it's very easy to translate into something efficient in user mode because you it's going to be the to answer the question when can I destroy this value um, is very hard in user mode but in kernel mode it's you have ways to know it okay so garbage collectors um, this is one of the reason I I think it's uh, more clever to write very high performance program in C++ for now. Uh, it's because you can do anything you want with the memory. And maybe 80% for the lifetime of your program, you can rely on a garbage collector. And that's what you do when you use share pointers in a way. But when you have these corner cases that are going to impact your scalability, uh, you want to have the freedom to be, to be able to do whatever you want uh, with memory. And this is very important. And this is why C++ is very powerful, because you basically can run in automatic mode uh, whenever you want. And then when you reach a difficult situation, you can go as low as you want. So that's it. Again, um, the idea is don't try to have a unified, single strategy to manage memory in your program. You have so many different things that are going to happen. And especially because you have designed your program into modules. <coughs> so maybe in a module, you don't really care what's going on with memory in a way that just using shell pointer is going to be enough. But maybe to take the example of our software, when you have um, the module which is responsible for incoming connections and you want to be very very fast to say okay i have a connection then maybe you have to become a bit crazy about very going very very fine to in terms of memory management and this is the more c plus plus ish part of the presentation thank you for <laughs> staying so far um the 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 thing you have and this is one thing i liked about the outmood presentation is stop thinking about threads that is, when you want to make a scalable software, you say, oh, I'm going to have threads, I'm going to have features, I'm going to have asynchronous operations. You don't know what you're going to need. But to um, know many different techniques is very good. To play with it is very good because the day you need it, it's going to be accessible in your brain. And you're going to say, oh, this is a case where this is a good usage of such technique. But don't do it the other way which is, oh, I've seen about futures, so I'm going to use them somehow in my program. And this is why you're not going to get the very good um, behavior. So in this um, conference, you're going to see a lot of techniques, and 
what I would, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play with everything I don't know, but I'm certainly not trying to go back and say, oh, I'm going to add this in the software. I say, I wait, I let it sink a, little, uh, a bit, and when I'm comfortable with it, and when I feel that it's a good usage, then I'm going to use it. This is, would be my advice to you. So in C++11, we have many, many cool things, such this one. Um, this one is also interesting. Lambda, obviously, but it's more convenient. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this or this, and I'm going to talk about locks, but not the locks from C++11. Uh, um, so you have a bit, this one is very nice. It's uh, to um, very often uh, in your program, uh, you have to uh, initialize a value only once. Um, when this happens, uh, it's not that easy into, in a multi-threaded context to do it, and this does it for you in a safe way. So don't hesitate to have a look at all these techniques, they are interesting. Lock free structures, um, we've designed our own lock free structures, we've done this, but we are crazy, and we should not, you should not do it because uh, this was a way of pain, of suffering, I really don't wish you to, to take. Uh, plus, you, have, uh, you start to have a very good implementation of lock-free structure. You have one in Boost, uh, I've played just a little bit with it. Uh, you have the Intel threading building blocks, uh, which are very interesting. So, unless you are 100% sh sh certain that you need a lock-free structure and in a way uh, that doesn't exist, just just don't try to implement your own. There was a good talk uh, yesterday by um, Tony about why it's very hard. Um, just my advice to you, don't do it. <laughs> and it would not be surprised that in, two, in that in a couple of months we find nasty bugs in Boost Lock Free, not because uh, it sucks, but because it's very hard to get right, uh, especially in obscure platforms. Um, so the Lock Free queues, um, it's the most straightforward lock fee structure you can use. Um, you should start with that, and when you're comfortable, you play with other. Um, we have a custom lock fee skip list, which is, you can imagine, a lock fee map. This is the way it works. Uh, basically, the difference between a lock fee structure and lock non lock fee structure, it says you can concurrently call this operation and it's going to work and it's going to be consistent. But, in the concept, in the in the context of your program, it may change the 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 meaning of what you're doing, because remember, most likely in your structure when you are when you were accessing your you maybe let's say your map, um, and you were doing maybe an iteration or anything I don't know, when it's lock free, it doesn't work the same way. It means that you can have concurrent modifications. It's only going to say well. It's not going to crash. It's not going to be corrupted. But the values, they, you have no, no, really, no idea about what they can be. So if you want to play with lock-free structure, a good starting point is you have a foreground process. Yes? Are you basically saying that you can run into an ABA problem? No. I'm saying that um, you can enter into, uh, the question is, can I, run into an ABA program, which is um, when uh, um, it's an internal program where uh, lock for queue uh, think it's accessing an, the same object, but it's actually accessing a new object. Uh, so, no, the thing is, the logic of your program can be impacted by the usage of lock for structures, because um, you are... No, no. It's um, let's say you have um, an object uh, which is uh, accessing a map, and there is a, or a vector, or whatever, and there is a request which consists in looking into the vector, all the values, and maybe modifying one. And if you are using a concurrent vector, then it's going to work the same way. But you can have a concurrent modification, and you can make a reply that is essentially wrong. Like, uh, the object is not there, uh, no, it's there. See what I mean? So it's a logic problem. No, it works. I mean, I, I'm sure that uh, there is a decent level of quality in the boost lock free. I'm not saying there is that kind of problem. Um, so, the, I, we like the TBB uh, queue, 
Uh, it's very easy. It's a very common problem. You have a foreground process and you have a background process and you want to exchange a message. Maybe you have a module and you have another module and you want to exchange a, a message. You can use a um, condition variable, but if you want to go fast, you can use a queue and it's going to you push your value and this is going to wake up as soon as it's got one. And so the exit condition, this is not especially the best way to do it, but you can say that you have a special message that is going to indicate that the background thread should do it. But this is a good starting point to play with the concurrent uh, structure. In TBB, you also have concurrent vectors, which are interesting, uh, concurrent hash map, you also have a uh, concurrent structure in uh, Facebook Folly, if you have played with it. Um, there are other libraries. So play with structure. Remember that's going to change the logic of your program, but you can really get a lot of performance because it means that you're not going to uh, acquire lock. You're not going to have some sort of thread synchronization. Uh, the TLS is a very la surprise du chef. Ah bah, yes. <laughs> Uh, that it means uh, it's a very powerful tool because it basically means I have my sandbox in my thread and I can do whatever I want with it and no other thread can access it so I don't have to lock, I don't have to do anything it's my private realm um, just remember that accessing data in the TLS uh, is much slower than accessing the stack or accessing uh, the uh, data which can be uh, optimized by the compilers to be in the registers. So it's intelligent to get the value into a local copy if you just say that you have an int in the three local storage, do your manipulation on it and then save it on the TLS if you want. But don't uh, do all your manipulation directly on your TLS variable. Variable. Um, so this is in the standard. Um, I have absolutely no idea of what guarantees the standard makes about the performance into uh, regarding thread local. Um, if you have any idea, please raise your hand. Um, remember that the TLS is some sort of big array shared with between thread. Each thread has an index into the array, so they don't compete to access uh, the same data. Uh, it can be very slow and another thing to understand is that the operating system is providing you with uh, a certain number of guaranteed entries. For example, in Windows, you have the guarantee that you can get 64 entries into the TLS. But as you can see, 64 is not a lot. So you can very quickly run out of TLS entries. So don't um, use, for example, the TLS as a map, but rather store a pointer to a map into the TLS. And this is to give you a trick about change the gravitational constant of the universe. Uh, we're going to see why atomic sucks. Um, uh, well, it doesn't suck, uh, but it's, it's very, let's say, it's very nasty the way it works. Um, Let's, let's say you want to have some weight-free process-wide unique value. That is, um, it's a very common problem. You have a program and you want to guarantee that you're going to return a an ID, for example, that's going to be unique for the lifetime of your program. Um, straightforward way to do it, you have a um, shared atomic value and this works. I mean, this is okay. This is guaranteed to work. But what are you doing? You're, going, you're doing a shared write. That is, every thread which is going to request an ID is going to kill your scalability because it's going to wait for a write on an atomic. And this is why atomic are nasty, because they make you believe that you're lock-free. Yes, you are lock-free in the sense that no thread is going to... Um, lock-free means basically that you have the guarantee that no thread is going... Uh, one thread is at least not going to starve and wait-free means that no thread is going to starve. Um, so yes, okay, it works and yes, it's better than having a lock. But what you can do is maybe just have a value in the TLS that it's going to be unique for each thread and just have a value that maybe is going to be guaranteed to be unique for each thread, which is the thread ID. And this is a, 
assuming that there is no shared write or any access here. This is perfectly scalable in the sense that no thread is going to write to the uh, same location. So this one is much, much better than this one because you don't write to the same location. Um, so Atomix, the, there was a, so Tony yesterday explained a much more about Atomix, so I'm going to not spend too much time about, about it. Uh, it's nice that it's in the standard now, so you don't have to, re to rely on a platform-specific implementation. You don't have to play with volatile or whatever. You, you, it's in the standard, so it guarantees that if you access uh, the data, you have the proper memory fences. So this is very important. And in some cases where you can get more performance with um, relaxing the constraints on your atomics, but you may have surprises with this because I'm not sure that all the compilers uh, implement uh, the relaxation properly. So basically what you need to remember, remember with atomics is you have a way to um, update um, scalars in a, an efficient way without any lock and without using platform dependent code in some times sometimes it's useful but generally speaking as we've seen in the previous example um, every time you write to a shared uh, memory location atomics lock whatever it's not going to scale so duplicate data if you must do whatever you want, I don't care, but remember every time your thread are writing to a shared location, you are killing your scalability. And this one, this is, so sometimes you have to lock because of maybe logic, because of many things, because um, even although you have modules that run different tasks, etc., etc., it's very difficult, it's a bit integrous to say, no, I will never lock, I will never, at some point you need, even if it's not uh, for a long time, you're going to need to access a shared memory location. So in that case, um, you may want to consider lightweight locks. Uh, what they are is basically it's um, a spin lock is just uh, checking a variable. If it's one, then it means it's locked and you spin until it's zero and then you access. And you have also reader writer lightweight locks. Uh, again, few words about the reader writer. Generally, they don't scale at all. So this is another case of saying, well, I don't understand. I have a read writer lock and my software doesn't uh, scale. It's because maybe the implementation of your reader writer lock uh, writes to shared memory location and you're dead. And that kind of stuff is very nasty. Uh, so when to use lightweight locks instead of vanilla locks that we have in the standard now? The, ans the answer to that is you should use them um, if you're going to just um, manipulate data, m make operations for a few cycles, like just changing a couple of things. And in this case you should use a spin lock. Um, you have also in the TBB, as you've seen, it's uh, Intel thinning, threading building blocks. Uh, you also have queuing mutex, uh, which are better because the spin lock is unfair. You can starve thread with uh, the spin lock because um, the way it works, um, it makes no guarantee uh, to w which thread is going to get the data. Uh, so it's a bit uh, nasty. The, they have the queuing mutex, uh, which is fair and which scales better because each lock is going to spin on its own cache line, which is much better. In this case, you have a shared access, uh, shared write access. But if you lock for very few cycles, you don't care because effectively no thread is going to hold the lock at the same time. So this is a very nice thing to use. Um, we use them a lot internally and they've solved a lot of scalability issues. Uh, yes, and transactional memory, it's the talk right after, um, and synchronous operations. So I did not spend too much time about it because to me, asynchronous operations, it's generally related to input output. 
and you should not try to make asynchronous operations for the sake of it. Just make sure that it makes sense uh, in your context. And please have a look at what the operating system is offering you in uh, FreeBSD, you have Capel, uh, overlapped IO. Ah, this is what we use in Windows. <laughs> now I remember and you have many many tools to help you with that uh, so I have only one spark but <laughs> uh, so again the idea is to uh, remember that um, you must know many techniques you know must know many tricks but don't try to use them all at the same time and don't try to use them all at any cost maybe you don't need make your software you make a scalable design. When you reach limits, then try to dig up. And maybe you will have to go very, very far in terms of optimization like we did, or maybe not. Because the compilers are doing a really good job, the operating system are doing a very good job. So if you have a clean implementation, if you have um, something which is basically sound, then it, you may have very, very good performance. But the approach of taking an existing program and trying to make it scalable, this is the impossible way. This is not going to work. Um, tools of the trade. So just, uh, oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> You're going to use this one and this one. Uh, we use that uh, a lot. Uh, basically, you're going to need tools to be able to measure your performance at a very low level. Uh, Intel gives uh, sales, actually it doesn't give, it doesn't give the, the software, a very, very good um, tool to me measure your software at very, very low level. You can access the counters in the CPU and you can see if you are wasting cycles and why and how. Um, Valgrind is also very useful because uh, you can run into nasty race conditions. Oh, I forgot to tell you, the spin lock, it's got a very nice feature when it deadlocks, it lives lock. So your processor is going to 100%. So this is nice because you, s you can make, a, you enter the debugger and you are where you are locking. So when you are deadlocking, you are absolutely nowhere because it's maybe just the thread is sleeping and you don't know where you are, do you are but in the, with the spin lock, you are where you are live locking when you have the de deadlock. Uh, so this is the paper I talked to you about, and this is this one is very interesting. It's a very good book, very good description of techniques. Uh, it explains how you would build a lock-free structure, and you're going to understand why you don't want to do it. Um, this one is very interesting because it explains you how locks work which is always very interesting but if you have only one book to take i would say this is this one and this one is more interesting for you uh, in i mean from an intellectual point of view and of course the documentation is it's a good documentation in that they give you a lot of examples which are a good way to start um, and that's it if you have any question i'm here for your question I've finished a bit early, yeah, right. Okay, but when I'm finished, I'm finished. <laughs> yes? Can you go back yes, I can. To the way you are getting a unique ID yes. Unique ID. I have a bug in it, You're right? Yeah. Yes. I think it will only work if, if you assume that this get ID doesn't, basically, the ID is not being used if the updates are started. Yes. Yes. The remark is um, this will work if get TID has got some nice properties to sum up what you said. And if it does, then you can probably create your own using the Tony and just do it once when the thread starts. Yes. Yes, this is a very good suggestion. What the, the comment is if get TID uh, doesn't work the way you expect it to work, that is, it's not going to give you a unique value for each thread. So let's say you kill a thread, you restart a thread, it's going to give you uh, to reuse the same value. Um, what you can do is you can, may have an atomic which is going to be initialized uh, once you start the thread. <coughs> and so you have the guarantee that you're going to just access once per thread the shared value. 
and you know that it's going to be unique. So it's a very good, very good idea. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Uh, okay. I, I was just wondering what are these latency requirements and what's the order of magnitude that we are talking about out there? Uh, you, your question is what are the latency requirements for our product N? Yes. And, and what's the order of magnitude? Milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds? Oh, the, the, do you want to know the order of magnitude of uh, the order of magnitude? Yeah, Okay, um, it really depends on what you on what kind of operation. Um, the the latency we have we offer is the latency TCP gives you. Okay. The latency we offer is the latency TCP gives you. We that is we have no overhead. Uh, then it's really dependent on so many factors that. Uh, I can. Um, I have an EA, so I cannot answer that question <laughs> exactly. But um, what what we do generally is uh, the customer is saying, "Well, I want this to go that fast." Then we make it that fast, generally with uh, maybe some operating system tuning or maybe just uh, changing, getting the right hardware, etc. But what we've done in software is saying. We want the software to be free in terms of overhead. That is, it's not going to add anything. And this is what we've done. So I think it's, we had maybe a couple of cycles uh, for some operations. For the connections, uh, we use asynchronous operations. So we, we, well, at some point, I think it's uh, like any other TCP software. Then whenever we can, we add a little bit of intelligence to get very low. And if you want to go further, then you have to switch to other protocols or other systems. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, yeah. And so the follow-up then that would be is, is that do you guys, for example, use um, thread affinity so that people yes. force to certain code? Yes. Do you guys make use yes. of kernel bypass for uh, the leak or anything like that? Yes. Um, I didn't want to, uh, the question is, do we kind of pin threads or do you, we use thread affinity? And the answer is yes. And what we do is we make sure that when we receive a user request, it's going to say, stay within the same thread for as long as it can. Because uh, switching to another thread is very expensive. Uh, another example I didn't give is when you are um, locking, uh, the operating system can reschedule your thread, which is called conveying, and this is very expensive. With uh, small locks, lightweight locks, you don't have that problem, which is why it's, uh, you can get a little bit of extra performance with them. But yes, the answer is yes, and there is no way around it if you really want to reach the high notes in terms of performance. It actually forced us to go back from a kind of more elegant design to a more brutal design about, uh, okay, we're going to stay in the same, uh, same thread. Okay. Yes? In the beginning, you were talking about these modules yes. communicate with messages. Yes. Can you explain how, this, how these message queues are implemented? Yes, we use log for queues. Need to pass then to one okay, so. What you what we do you can use um, you can use uh, in Intel threading blocks you have uh, out of the box a thing which is called pipeline and another thing which is called graph which is going to do everything for you. Uh, we used that until we realized the thread affinity problem. <laughs> And then we had to go a little bit and develop some kind of low level interface to the TBB scheduler. But the idea is, I think for 99% of the cases, you can just try, start with that. And if it's not enough, maybe you will play with the sch scheduler of a TBB. Um, but that's pretty much it. And how it's done, generally, it's just a question of having a queue between each module. And you want to have um, each task running in a scheduler. 
it's kind of using a thread pool. You don't want to run a thread for each request you have because it's going to be terrible performance. You want to have everything pre-allocated if you can, and then you're going to uh, dispatch that. But remember that it has you, the work you have to send as a task has to be big enough because it's got a cost to send a task to a different thread. And this is uh, not always obvious. Yes? You mentioned you want to pre-allocate everything. Does that mean you're pooling objects and then are you reusing them? Uh, what? You, you said you want to pre-allocate yes. as much as possible. Yes. So then are you using, a, are you pooling your objects? Ah, okay. And then so the question is, um, we are, we are you pulling everything you can, pre-allocating everything you can, and the question is, are we pulling our own objects? So some objects we are pulling, such as the sessions, some other we are just allocating on demand, especially new entries added by the, um, by the user, because it, it, we have no idea what it's going to be, and then it's going to be maybe the user decides to add 200 megabytes of data. And we have, at some point, we have to allocate the data and to write in on the disk. And there, there is no, at some points, we have to work, even if we're French. <laughs> 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 so I hope I answer your question. Are you guys always running on, is your uh, database always running by itself on a computer? Or do you have to uh, basically shield yourself from other processes? Okay, so the question is, how does our database run in, in a dedicated computer or not? The answer is not only it runs on a dedicated computer, but it can run on any number of computers and it will automatically scale because it's a peer-to-peer -peer software. So you can maybe start the database on one server and then uh, you can add it to the second server. It's going to reorganize the data automatically. Uh, it's hot plug and play, so yes, it needs to run in a dedicated software, and we actually have a list of requirements on the machine. We require ECC memory, we require some kernel um, parameters, because otherwise it's a nightmare to understand why you have a performance penalty. So when you're, you said you can dynamically add other servers? Yes. Uh, <coughs> I assume that means there must be some discovery? Yes. Of these data. So how do you do the discovery? Um, the question is um, if we can support uh, dynamic, uh, the dynamic addition of new servers, how we do that probably through, through discovery? And the answer is yes. We use an algorithm come from the MIT which is called CORD. And with a lot of uh, modification, especially in the area of the papers where they say this is left as an exercise to the reader. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so yes, you have some uh, pooling in the background and you're checking that your neighbor and your previous node is still alive. And if not, or if a new node is coming in and say, hey, I'm new, s then you start to reorganize. And since it's peer-to-peer, -peer, when you add a node, it's not going to destroy everything. And it works, uh, you really can add uh, a node like this and it's magical. Very good technology. <laughs> Any other question? You want to go to the lunch break? Well, thank you very much.